So today we're going to be exploring the question of what is stuff? Now you'll notice my use of the word there stuff. It's a very ambiguous term because there's a lot more terminology we can use out there. And we're going to get more specific with our wording as soon as we comprehend the definitions of the words we're using. Now, what is stuff? Okay, well, I guess you can start by separating things into two very, very basic categories, okay? Now, you've got nothing, and you've got something, okay? What exactly differentiates these two things? All right, well, nothing, I guess you could say, is pretty self-explanatory. It doesn't exist. Something, how can you determine if something's something? Well, an object becomes something when it comes into being, okay? Only things that have being can be considered something, all right? Everything in this material world, everything on our planet, everything in our universe is something. Everything has being, all right? Which means humans do not have a good representation, a tangible example of what nothing really is. We can speculate and say that nothing was what existed before God created the world, but none of us can possibly know what the world was like before God created the world. Or if the world even existed. There you go. So let's dive deeper in here. Let's try and differentiate exactly what something is. Well, we know that something is a derivative of two principalities, two origins, two uniting factors. All right. Something can be broken down into A, its form, and its matter. So a form is representative of something's actionable representative purpose in the world, okay? As humans, as living beings, meaning not just humans, we have animals, we have plants, their purpose is given, imparted unto them by their soul. But everything else that doesn't have a soul, let's say this marker, also has a form. Because remember, everything that is something has a form in conjunction with matter. So, if this isn't living, that means it doesn't have a soul. What is the form of this marker? Well, it can be explained as, don't worry, I have another marker, markerness. Now, what, what the heck is markerness? It defines the ability of the marker to behave like a marker, okay? Let's say, yes, you could use it as a marker, but it would be better used as a lollipop. Well, then the form wouldn't be marker at all. If it's not that good of a, as a marker, but it would be more effectively used as a lollipop, then it would just be a lollipop. But you would die if you tried to use this like a lollipop, so it's obviously not a lollipop. That's what we mean. It's intended actionable purpose. All right. So a form gives purpose, gives meaning, gives embodiment to the matter. All right. Now, what is matter? Well, we can't really show you matter because like I'm trying to explain to you, form and matter cannot exist as two mutually exclusive halves. You cannot have one without the other. I cannot show you form without matter. I can not show you matter without form. I can only show them to you united as one. All right. So what is matter then? Well, I told you what form is. The marker's ability to behave and effectively be used as a marker. Well, what's it made of? It's made of plastic. It's made of ink. It's made of a uh, little branding. So yeah, that, that's, that's the gist of what matter is. What is it physically made of? A desk is made of wood. Why is a desk not a chair? Because a desk would be better used as a desk. Okay, yes, yes, you can use it as a chair. But it would it's more effective as a desk than as a chair. A chair can be used as a desk but it would be more effectively used as a chair. All right, they're both made of wood. They're both made of the same matter. The thing that differentiates them here in this case is the form. Now you can have it the other way around, okay? You can have a desk made of metal, 
and you can have a desk made of wood. All right? They both have the exact same form, the exact same purpose, but why are they different? Because their matter is different. Okay, so now that we know what form and matter are, let's explore another very profound discovery of the Aristotelian thinkers of the time. Everything in the world has the capacity for change. Every being, everything in the world has the capacity for change. Okay. Now, what exactly is change? Change is the action of an object going from potency over towards actuality. Now, what, what's potency and actuality? Okay, well, as the name might imply, potency implies an object's, something's potential for change, okay? As a human, I have the potential to get older. I have the potential to die. I have the potential to eat. They are potential changes. I am not dead. I am not eating. Yes, I am growing older. So, I guess you could say that my potential for age, increasing age, is constantly becoming an actuality. It's constantly moving over into actual reality. You could think of actuality as what really happens, as what reality is. Okay? Because in reality, I am not eating. But, in reality, I am aging. I am actually aging. And I have the potential to age more. Okay? So, that, that's a really interesting example I just stumbled upon. If it's constantly potency, and it's constantly actuality, well, that doesn't make sense. How can it be both? That's just the point. It's not both. I am 15 right now, okay? I have the potency to be 16, but I'm not 16 yet. Some might argue that it's a guarantee that I'll become 16. No, because I have more than just one potency. And my potencies can contradict one another. I have the potency for death. And if death gets actualized, if death becomes a reality, then I am death. I never actualized the potency of turning 16. It's an interesting distinction. All right, so the difference between potency and actuality, this covers how something can change into something else, how it can undergo a change, all right? That's the big word we discussed here. Change, all right? The action of going from potency to actuality is change. Now let's explore change, because change is also a very broad term. Change can be split up into a substantial change and an accidental change. An accidental change is something that does not fundamentally change your matter or your form, okay? For example, age right here. Age is an accidental change, because my form, I'm still a human, I still have a human soul, all right? I'm still called to live out my vocation, my purpose, I'm still the same matter, I'm still made of cells, but I'm still aging. That's accidental change. None of the former matter changes, but the way it is embodied, the way it is expressed, changes. Now that stands in stark contrast to a substantial change. A, substant a substantial change would fundamentally alter one of these two things, or both of them, for example. But let's go to the wood and ash example, okay? Taking a piece of lumber 
setting it on fire would produce ash, okay? In that substantial change, I have changed the matter. The wood is no longer wood. It is carbon dioxide and dust. And its form has changed. It no longer possesses woodness. It can no longer be used as wood. It can no longer serve the purpose of being wood. It now has ashness. It can be used as ash, whatever the purpose of ash may be. You know, my mother uses ash as a dish detergent to clean the dishes, because in communist Romania, we didn't have dish soap. We used the ash from the fireplace, and damn well let me have you believe that is some good dish detergent. <laughs> anyway. Substantial change alters one or both of the fundamental characteristics of being, okay? All right. So, we talked a lot about purpose here, all right? But let's go a little bit further deep into that notion, the notion of purpose, okay? So purpose can be divided into things like your first act and your secondary acts. Now notice the distinction here. First act is singular, Secondary acts is plural. That means you can only have one first act, but you can have more than one secondary acts. All right? Your first act is always your pure existence. All right? But let's go back to the example of form. Form is the purpose of the matter. Form is the purpose of the matter. Okay? If the purpose of this pen, so what is the purpose of the pen? Well, some might say, well, the purpose is to write, the purpose is to get erased, like that. Oh, I hope that does not leave a mark. Anyway, the purpose is to get erased, but the primary act, the primary act, which is often overlooked, is existence, okay? Because nothing can happen unless, first and foremost, its purpose was to exist. If it didn't exist, it would be nothing. Everything must have the purpose of existence for it to be something. Because if it does not have existence, it doesn't have being, and therefore it is nothing. The secondary acts of a table could be to be written upon, to be used as support for other things. Okay, so we talked a lot about purpose here in relation to form. Well, let's dive a little deeper into what exactly form can consist of. All right, well, let's bring this guy down here. You know, I, I feel there's, there's a little lack of color in here. Let's bring back the red marker. Okay, I definitely did not steal these from Shavana. <laughs> So form, you can distinguish into a substantial form and an accidental form. Huh. Well, doesn't that look familiar? All right. Let's take a walk down through substantial and accidental, shall we? Okay. Now, slightly different meanings here, but you can see the correlation. In terms of change, change right here, a substantial change was something that fundamentally dealed with one of these two things. Accidental change did not have much bearing on this, all right? In terms of sub substantial form, a substantial form is something's primary form. The form that allows it to exist as an individual thing. Okay? Individuality. Everything, every tangible object anyone has ever experienced has substantial form. Okay? This marker, this is not a pen, I don't know why I wanted to call it a pen. This marker has substantial form. It has the substantial form of markerness. So, markerness, all right? That describes its purpose, its primary form. Okay? There are many different 
renditions of markerness. All right. And there are many different renditions of a marker. Okay. So that's important to realize here. Marker is your base. It is the thing which all the characteristics of it live inside. Now, accidental form, I like to call it characteristics, because characteristics are inextricably bound to the object they are characterizing. This is a red marker. This is a black marker. Notice how they have the same substantial form, because they are made for the same purpose. To write, to be erased, to educate with. But they have different characteristics. One is red, one is black. These do not have any bearing on its purpose. Okay? So, accidental form of, let's say, me. All right, I am a human being, my substantial form, I have a human soul, there goes my marker, don't worry, I can steal more. Where was I? Accidental form. My accidental form is, I am a teenager, okay? You can never see a teenager outside of humanness. Okay. Teenager is an exclusively human construct, an exclusively human characteristic, an exclusively human accidental form. <clears throat> All right. I think that's good. Let, let's move on a bit. All right. Now let's unite some of the two principles we've been talking about. We've, <clears throat> we've got substantial and accidental form. We've got substantial and accidental change. Okay, so let's bring matter into the mix. All right, well, matter hasn't been shown enough love yet. Well, let's talk about matter over here. We've got prime matter and we've got secondary matter. All right, so we talked about how form actualizes matter. Okay, matter has the potential to be anything. Form is what decides how that potential actualizes, what the reality becomes. All right? So let's picture it this way. Let's picture we've got a cement mixer. All right? The cement in that cement mixer is wet cement. It could be anything. It could be shaped into anything. Okay? Let's say I wanted to make a sidewalk square. The cement has the potential to become a sidewalk square, but it is not. The form is something you could think of as the mold. Once the mold and the wet cement are united with one another, the form can only actualize one of the potencies. The form, the shape, the mold, can only turn the cement into a square. It can't turn it into a square and a circle at the same time. Okay? So the form, the mold, actualizes the cement into a square and only a square. All right. Let's bring it back here. So prime matter, it is pure potency. Prime matter has the potential to become anything. So, if we unite a substantial form with prime matter, prime matter having the potential to become anything, we create something. You combine prime matter and a substantial form to get a marker. Okay? That marker is now a secondary matter. Because, okay, the marker has its own set of potentials. All right? The marker has very limited potential 
when it's compared to prime matter, okay? The marker has the potential to be any color, any size, any amount of ink, but the marker does not have the potential to be a monkey, okay? An accidental form cannot actualize secondary matter into a monkey. The accidental change could make it blue, could make it black, could make it red, all right? These two markers are comprised of the exact same secondary matter, but the secondary matter has been actualized by two different accidental forms. There we go. Now you're not gonna have to watch me erase any of these boards because I can use the power of... Oh, looks like it only half worked. Eh, I'll probably need this section anyway. Okay, so that is, that's my marker gone. This is my blue marker now. So first and foremost, we've got the material cause. So the material cause references something's matter. You cannot cause a TV to exist if you do not have the matter necessary to actualize a TV, all right? So matter, material, get it? Matter has to be actualized into the final form. Excuse me, this is what I uh, talked about first with our little vocabulary spiel, the final product, not the final form, because form means something else, okay? Form goes into formal cause. The formal cause has to deal with the form, as you might expect. Given my screen, my plastic, my power cord, you know, I might as well make a monitor, like a computer monitor, all right? An engineer can make a computer monitor with those components. So, you need to actualize the potency of the matter with the correct form. You need to actualize it with, I guess, TV-ness. So this is pretty basic tying into what we've been talking about. In order to cause a TV to exist, you need to have a matter with the potential to create a TV, and you need to have a form that will actualize the potential of the matter in order to give it the purpose of a TV, the effectiveness of a TV. So let's move on beyond those two preliminary causes. We now, effective cause is why did the creator create it? So the creator wanted to build, let's say, a flat screen TV. So the effective cause is the decisions that, let's say, the engineer took to select the parts needed to make a TV. Decide how he was going to arrange the parts, what screws he was going to use, and how it would all fit together to make a TV. The effective cause is what matter was chosen and how the matter was actualized to make a TV. But to actually decide the outcome of these two, the outcome is caused by the effective cause. If you're making a cake, you chose the ingredients and you chose a way to make it. And together, that's the effective cause that made your cake. Final cause is what is ultimately done with the final product of the cake, okay? Accidental form. Some families might decide to eat the cake after dinner. Then the, the final cause would be the cake is used as dessert because the secondary matter of cake is just food, okay? It is up to the final cause to decide what that food really means. Is it a dessert? Is it something to have in the middle of the day? Is it something that you let go stale and use to prop your door open? 
these are all accidental forms, oh, down here, accidental forms that actualize the secondary matter of cake. So what's really interesting about this entire proof we just did is now we can move on to the culmination, which effectively states that potency can be actualized, okay? We covered that. Potency can be actualized. But it takes something that is already in actuality in order to actualize something, okay? God is pure actuality. Now, what do we mean by that? It means nobody actualized him. God was never in a state of potency. He existed always in actuality. All right? So he was the first and only being of pure actuality. Thus, he is the only thing that could have possibly turned the potency of the empty universe, the potency of nothingness, he was the only person capable of actualizing the potency of nothingness into somethingness. I'm not sure if that's a word, but I'm going to use it for the context. Okay, now that's, that's really profound now, isn't it? All right. Oh, so that was the whole point of the unit, just to prove the existence of God. We went from what is stuff to God is real. <laughs> it's amazing the places philosophy takes you. Anyway... It's been a pleasure, Mr. Patricio. Enjoy life.